In this video, what I'll talk about is the uh, application of social influence that we covered last time in terms of a real-life scenario. And one thing to remember when I'm giving a story like this is that anecdotes are not evidence. Anecdotes never provide data about how the world works. However, um, a, a decent anecdote uh, can at times be very useful for understanding exactly how it is that these things work. How, it, how is it that these processes actually play out in the real world? So if you recall from last time with the Sharif experiment and the Ash experiment where Musafar Sharif uh, in the 1930s set up an experiment using a dot of light against the black background and the dot of light appeared to be moving. In fact, it was stationary. But when you have people in the room who are sitting next to the real subject and those confederates are giving estimates of the amount of movement of the light, uh, that will have an impact uh, on how much the true subject believes the dot of light is moving. So reality becomes altered based on the information that the person is getting from the social environment about the ambiguous stimulus. The stimulus looks like it's moving, it's not really moving, but the real subject uses the information from the others in the room in order to make up his or her mind about how much that dot of light is moving. So that's informational influence. Uh, and when that happens, uh, the person who's being influenced seems to be satisfied that that is an accurate representation of how far the light is moving. Now the ash experiment is profoundly different. That's the one where you have the three lines on one board and the comparison line on a separate board and the subject has to pick which of the three lines matches the uh, comparison line. And the way that Ash set that up is that you have this room full of people, all of whom are working for the experimenter. They're all Confederates except for one, the true subject. And the true subject is trying so hard to report the true state of affairs. However, everyone else is saying the wrong thing. And so the true subject is placed in this difficult position of either saying the truth or going against the group. Now these are people that the subject doesn't know. There should be no pressure, overt pressure, in order to conform. But even, even in light of that, uh, we see, particularly with the video that I posted to Canvas, uh, that people are very heavily constrained by the social forces that uh, are apparent when you have a group saying the wrong thing. Even if you know that it's wrong, it feels bad to go against them. And so you have people saying the wrong thing, even though they know that it's wrong, simply because they don't want to be a nonconformist. They don't want to not fit in. So the example that I have that I'm going to walk through today takes place in 1980. Here's a photo of me from 1979. That's at Stuyvesant High School in New York City. Stuyvesant is one of these high schools where you have to test in it's an achievement test and it's pretty tough to get in. I didn't take it seriously. I think you can tell that by the photo. In fact, I was uh, a, a member of uh, what you could call the stoner crowd uh, and I was smoking a lot of pot back then. I, I'm not proud of it, but I'm also not ashamed of it, particularly now that marijuana is legalized in so many states, including Illinois. But I quit smoking pot when I turned 18 because I understood that it was not doing me any favors. In fact, it was setting me back in my studies. And I could have done a lot, uh, a lot more than I did at Stuyvesant. I could have gotten more out of it. Here's another photo of me at Stuyvesant uh, with some of the people that I used to hang out with. Uh, and this particular photo is from 1980. So this is right about the same time uh, as the incident in question, which I will describe. Here are some of my friends. We had a nice crew. We used to play a lot of frisbee, freestyle, uh, you know, ultimate frisbee, where you it's like frisbee football. And, you know, we used to get high and um, had a pretty strong sense of self. We all did. Uh, a lot of uh, my colleagues from back then went on to become professors of various disciplines. 
it was it was a very interesting time in New York City to be to be in New York City. Nineteen seventies, the city uh, went bankrupt. So this this forms part of the backstory to the main story here. The decrepitude that was New York City at the time. You might have heard people talking about it. It was real. You know, there's an HBO show that takes place during that time period. There were prostitutes everywhere in Midtown Manhattan. There were drugs everywhere. There was crime everywhere. The murder rate was incredibly high. Times Square was the belly of the beast. It's, you know, it's not the tourist destination that it is today. Until about 15 years ago, it was really pretty rough. 15, 20 years ago. And when I was a kid, Times Square was just filled with uh, pornographic movie houses. And uh, as you see in this photograph, the next few photographs are <clears throat> actually ones that my father shot. My dad was a professional photographer. This one appears to show somebody who's been stabbed in broad daylight in Times Square. That's right there on the deuce. And you can see that there are police and paramedics on the scene. There's no suspect that's been apprehended. The police apparently got there afterwards and you can see this big crowd of people watching. And the police, this is before the police wore bulletproof vests. You can see that they're not militarized at all. They're just they're wearing cotton t-shirts and uh, blue shirts over that. The police are helping their paramedics put the, the victim onto a stretcher. And then in this one, uh, the police are grilling some uh, witnesses to get details about the crime. It was a rough area. I mean, it was, it was drugs, mostly heroin at that time. This is before the crack epidemic. Crack really hit around 1985. Prostitutes, drugs, porno movie houses, and, and then just regular people mixed in with all of that. So it was, it was a dangerous area, but it was an area that uh, people from New York, who, you know, real New Yorkers, took this in stride. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I saw crimes take place in Manhattan, I've, saw, I've seen chain snatchings, purse snatchings, robberies, uh, I've seen knife fights, people getting beaten, stabbed, and, and so on. Fortunately, never been anywhere near any kind of a shootout, but I've seen the aftermath of that. Uh, I worked as a bike messenger in Manhattan in later years, in the mid-1980s, and I saw a lot, of, uh, a lot of that during that period of time. Anyways, from the same photo shoot, undercover detectives in the striped shirt and the tank top with a suspect I think in an unrelated crime in the subway system this is uh, in the subway ride underneath the previous photographs and I just I wanted to show these to show you uh, the environment that was New York it was a dirty environment that was filled with crime the crime rate was exceptionally high at that point in time and in the middle of this you had this organization called the Moonies the Moonies are named the Moonies after the, the founder and leader whose name was Reverend Sun Myung Moon, South Korean businessman who led a um, sort of, a, I guess you'd say a pseudo-Christian uh, revivalist style church that was very popular, uh, particularly in that period of time in the 1970s and 80s in New York City, in California, in San Francisco, but also in England, Australia, it's international. And this photograph here, I took from one of the self-published uh, Unification Church, that's their real name, books that I found online. And this is New York City. This is a, a group of followers of the Reverend Moon in New York City around 1979. So this is the year before I was involved with them. But I think I interacted with some of these individuals. In fact, the woman who's second from the the second person from the left looks like the person who attempted to recruit me into the Moonies. And so now it'll become clear why I was talking about Times Square. It was summer of 1980. It was late July or early August. And uh, school was out for the summer. I did not want to get a job for the rest of the summer. I wanted to do something interesting. I was very independent. Both of my parents were kind of bohemian and encouraged me to be independent. I used to go off camping on my own in that period of time, state parks in upstate New York. Uh, it was not a big deal. I, at age 16, I would go off and do things. I was uh, very independent, did not need my parents' permission to do anything. So I'm walking around Times Square in the afternoon, just taking in the sights of all the criminogenic type of people, you know, the dealers and the hustlers and the porno movie houses. 
I'm not actually taking part in any of that. I'm just interested to see it, you know, uh, from a somewhat safe distance. So it's afternoon. I think it was Friday, uh, although I'm not entirely sure. And this woman comes up to me, and I, I actually believe it's the woman in this photo who's the second person from left. I don't know what her name was. I'll just call her Mary so that I have a name. And she starts talking to me. She says to me, hey, how's it going? Oh, just fine. Would you be interested, and at this point I think she's going to ask for money, would you be interested in hearing about all the great work that we're doing? Uh, okay, sure, tell me. Well, uh, you, you should come over to our office. It's right around the corner. Our, our center is right around the corner on 43rd Street. And I say, well, tell me more about it first. Well, you can uh, have free uh, lunch. We've got a lunch buffet set up. We'll have a slideshow where we got photographs of all the great work that we're doing upstate. So, you know, we, th this goes on for a few minutes. I'm um, being noncommittal. And she was being friendly, but it was, uh, I don't know, it was maybe a little bit of a flirtatious thing but it was not in any sense overly sexualized. So, I, I, I mean, I didn't think she was a prostitute or anything like that. Uh, in fact, she was rather conservatively dressed. And so I, I agreed. I, I said, okay, let's go over to your center. So we go over there, and there's, it's right on 43rd Street on the ground floor. The, the building is still there. I mean, they still own it, I, I think. The Unification Church owns a ton of property. At that point in time, they had massive amounts of New York City real estate. So we go in. There's a buffet set up. And, then, you know, the food is decent. It's not great, but it's, it's, it's fine. I was not dissatisfied. Mary is accompanying me on all of this and standing next to me and chatting with me and sitting with me and eat my lunch and watch the slideshow and the slideshow is with an uh, old-fashioned projector on a screen and it shows slides of people in a setting in upstate New York a, a sort of a rural setting she explains that they have a summer camp up and that they're doing great work up there they're doing uh, wonderful things and um, if I were to visit I would see all the wonderful things that they're doing at this camp that they called Camp New Hope what I didn't understand then, or I, I didn't know, was that the, the Unification Church has New Hope as one of the names of many of the different properties and ventures that they partake in. They have boats named the New Hope and hotels and, I don't know, all kinds of things. And it, this was sort of the peak of their popularity in New York City. And when I say popularity, I don't mean that people love them. Uh, people were aware of the Moonies and considered them to be a malicious cult. In fact, there were surveys that were done back then in the 1980s in New York City and nationally, and there was a very high level of recognition of the name of the Unification Church and the Moonies in the American public, and the attitude about the Moonies was typically very negative, that it was a cult that took advantage of people. When I walked into the center, on 43rd Street, there was nothing there that said that it was the Unification Church. I was aware of what the Unification Church was, and I sort of, in the back of my mind, I thought this might be them that I'd heard about on the news, but there was nothing there that identified them as being the Unification Church of Reverend Moon. There was no photograph of Reverend Moon. There was no signage saying Unification Church. There was nothing. And that's a point of some controversy because in lawsuits that people had filed against the Unification Church at that point in time, you know, in years previous to that, the plaintiffs argued in several cases that they'd been tricked into it and that, that uh, no one had ever told them that, that this was the Moonies or the Unification Church. So the, the recruitment strategies were supposed to incorporate some acknowledgement of who they were. Uh, but they never did that. Uh, they never did that with me. I was I was with them for two weeks. They never came forward and said that they were the Unification Church. Okay, so so I'm at the center. It's after the slideshow. The slideshow takes about 20 minutes, and uh, Mary is chatting with me and asking me, you know, what I thought of it. I thought, hey, you know, that seems really nice. Oh well, you should come and see the great work that we're doing. Uh, well, maybe I will. And she says we've got a van right outside ready to go. Uh, why don't you come up with us right now? 
Whoa, wait a minute. Uh, no, I, I have to go home first. Uh, <laughs> I was actually kind of surprised at that. I did not expect her to say that we should just take off right there, you know, with a group of strangers and drive out of Manhattan. What I said is, you know, let me think about it. I think what you've got going on here seems really interesting. And that was honest. That was an honest statement on my part. But I have to go home and get some clothes. And that also was true. I also wanted some time to think about it. I, I wasn't going to ask permission from my parents. I was independent enough that, uh, you know, whether, whether they said yes or no really didn't matter to me. So I go home. I pack my, my uh, hiking backpack uh, filled with some clothes and a couple of books. I, you know, I figured I would have some downtime while I was there, just in case I wanted to have something to read. Uh, I had a Kurt Vonnegut book, I think it was Welcome to the Monkey House, and a, a book by Graham Greene. Greene was a, an English novelist between World War I and II, he was most active, and he used to write about Catholics having difficulty with their faith, which uh, I found to be a very interesting topic. I was sort of a student of comparative religions. Uh, at the age of 15, I was reading existentialist authors, philosophy, Eastern mysticism. By the age of 16, I was fairly deep into uh, Eastern mysticism and uh, particularly reading about Hinduism and Zen Buddhism. I didn't know as no enough about Christianity, having you know grown up in America, I knew a lot about it just being an American, but I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about it. One of my teachers back at Stuyvesant High School was Frank McCourt, who wrote Angela's Ashes, and uh, I loved hearing uh, Frank's uh, stories about the miseries of growing up as a poor Catholic in Ireland. I always thought that that was uh, both hugely entertaining, but also it gave me this window into uh, uh, a life that I had known nothing about. And I was, I was so inspired by McCourt that I tried to, actually at one point I tried to get my, my mother to marry him. Uh, my parents were getting divorced. They, they were sort of in the middle of that. And I said, hey, Mom, don't you want to go to the parent-teacher meeting? <laughs> uh, Frank's going to be there. <laughs> uh, that, that never uh, took off. But um, my mom and I were both fans of uh, McCord's writings, uh, which he produced after I left Stuyvesant. At any rate, so interested in religion, and I understood that this was a religious organization of some type. And I thought to myself, you know, I can uh, go spend some time with them for free and it'll be an interesting thing and it'll expand my knowledge base about comparative religion. So I decided to go. I go back the next and I, you know, I didn't tell my parents where I was going. 16 years old, uh, this is unheard of today, but uh, I, I ran away and joined a cult. <laughs> my mom, uh, God bless her, she uh, always used to make fun of me for that uh, years and years and years later. So I packed my bag filled with with a couple of books, some clothes, and I, I went back, took the train to Manhattan. I lived in Brooklyn. Took the train into Times Square, went over to the center at 43rd Street. There's Mary, waiting. There were some other recruits that other people had recruited. We all piled into the van and drove upstate New York. The place was called Camp New Hope. It was an old summer camp for kids that had been uh, sort of renovated. I mean, the buildings were clearly old, and the bunk beds were a little bit too small, uh, but uh, it, was, it was good enough. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. I've had a really hard time trying to pin down exactly where it is. I don't have any screenshots or photos. But this particular photo here shows people at that camp in the previous year. And I got this from one of the self-published books that the Unification Church has online. I probably interacted with some of these people. I don't think I'm in the photo. I think this is the previous year, 1979. But you get the idea. It's it's a kind of a wooded area. So we get there. We have lunch. Lunch is okay. The food is not bad. And some of the stories that people told of being in the Unification Church over the years was that they, you know, they were trying to conduct mind control through the food. And I that was not my experience at all. The food was not bad. I was a vegetarian anyway, so... Eating a lot of beans and rice was perfectly fine with me. So I was, I was happy with the food. So we have lunch, and while we're eating lunch, we're basically being lectured by people. And then after lunch, uh, it's songs. This is in a big communal dining hall, which is no longer there. And in that communal dining hall, you know, there's somebody up on stage strumming a guitar and singing. And uh, so this is after lunch. We all have to sing along with them. 
There's a lot of that. And then for the afternoon, we go back to our bunks. You know, the, the new recruits are divided up into different bunk houses. We sit at the picnic tables that are adjoining, you know, outside of the bunk houses, uh, about 10 or 12 of us at a time, in a, you know, in a smaller group. What happens next is really very interesting, and this is the tie-in to the conformity research. And I didn't understand any of that at that point in time because, you know, I was just a high school student who was, you know, still getting high smoking pot. I brought some pot with me to the Moonies, if you can believe that. You're not supposed to bring drugs to the cult. Everybody knows that, but I was still smoking. I, you know, when I turned 18, I stopped, but I was 16 years old. And I, you know, I brought a little bit of pot with me so that I can get high when no one was looking. <laughs> when I think back on that, I mean, that, of all the nutty things that I've done, that's definitely one of the nuttier things. So, um, so we're sitting around, and I'm totally sober at this point because, you know, I'm going to wait until nobody's looking at night for me to smoke up. We're sitting around this picnic table, and what I didn't understand at that point in time is that the first couple of people who took turns speaking were already longtime members of the Moonies. You know, they didn't say that they'd been members of the Moonies, so it, it seemed like they were new recruits, but they were just setting the stage that we were to follow, that the new recruits were supposed to follow. Um, as, as the days went on, that became completely clear to me, that they were... Uh, exerting social influence strategies over the new recruits uh, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. So we're, we're sitting at this uh, picnic table. It's a nice summer day, and the person says, you know, what his name is and, you know, what he used to do on the outside and how miserable his life was. And the next person goes and describes how miserable her life was. And I'm like, wait, what's going on here? Uh, why are these people describing how miserable their lives were? And then, you know, the next person, it's just, oh my God, it's, everybody has these terrible lives. And this one guy who was actually a recruit, he said that uh, he was a boxer and he didn't want to hurt people anymore and he's very dissatisfied with being a boxer. I looked at his nose and it looked like his nose has, had been broken quite a few times, so I'm thinking he wasn't a very good boxer. Maybe that's why he wasn't happy. <laughs> the definite boxer's nose just, you know, pushed in and mashed to the side. But yeah, so it went on like that. Every single person is now describing how bad their lives were and how happy they are to be here now. It gets to be my turn. And my life had been pretty good all around. I had nothing to complain about. I uh, had to come up with something, so I just started making stuff up. I just started lying and saying things that were not true about how horrible my life was. And they loved it. They thought it was great. They thought this was really good material, um, that this guy, this kid has great prospects. Now, I lied to them, and I told them I was 18. They, they did not know I was only 16 years old. They probably would not have let me join or, or come to the, to the organization, to the camp. So, yeah, I go on and say how, how miserable my life was and, and so on. So after that, everybody is, you know, the, the people who've been there for longer periods of time, they're all saying how how wonderful all of this is and how we're, you know, this is, it's so much, there's so much promise and goodness in the air here. And so rather than being a miserable spectacle of everybody just moaning about how bad their lives are, now all of a sudden it, everything is happy and optimistic. And, and that's the common theme that runs through this cult experience is that the people who are recruiting you, which is most of them, uh, are just constantly telling the newcomers how much we love you. We love you unconditionally. We love you no matter what. But please do listen to our message about um, the, the divine principle and in our interpretation of Christianity uh, because this is how we're going to save the world. Uh, so there's a very heavy component of uh, theological mysticism that goes along with this. And they don't reject the, the other... Uh, religions, you know, they're they're not rejecting of Eastern religion at all. But what they're saying is that they have their own brand of Christianity with their own interpretation of things, which are profoundly different than mainstream Christianity. Uh, I at least understood that much at the time that I was there. For example, one of the things that they said is that uh, the story of Adam and Eve has been interpreted incorrectly. Uh, the, Satan did not tempt Eve with an apple. 
In fact, their interpretation of the, the scripture is that Satan and Eve had sex together, and then Eve goes and has sex with Adam, and that's the original sin. That that is the, the uh, intergenerational original sin that starts with Eve having sex with Satan. <laughs> wow, that's, that's a lot different. And I think a lot of mainstream Christian uh, sects would say that this is a heretical belief. Okay, so, so the day, let me walk you through the, the, the typical day. And a lot of these social influence uh, aspects come out as I describe this. And so this will actually make the photo that's been on the screen for a few minutes here make more sense. The typical day starts 7 a.m. Somebody comes in singing a song with a guitar, waking everybody up in the bunkhouse. We all go out into this field, this field right here. And we do uh, some light calisthenics, you know, jumping jacks or whatever, touching your toes. It's not just jumping jacks and touching your toes. They do the love bomb, which is what you see here. So everybody is now holding hands, raising their arms up into the sky to praise God. And as the arms come down, I mean, everybody is yelling, a uh, gigantic, you know, in unison yell to the heavens. And then uh, as the arms come down, everybody does a gigantic group hug. It's, it's a really strong uh, group activity, which is to say they're forming a strong group identity through doing this. So now that we've really embraced ourselves, both literally and figuratively in terms of the group identity, then we go off to have breakfast. And while we're eating breakfast, then, you know, people are lecturing to us about the divine principle and, and the moon version of Christianity. And then after we eat, then it's songs. We're singing together. It's, it was just endlessly singing songs. And then it's off into smaller groups to have individual sermons and you know about one type of their philosophy or another and then it's <clears throat> lunch and then it's back to the tables to discuss how bad your lives were on the outside because everything on the outside is the devil's work and everything on the inside is goodness so they're setting up this false dichotomy that everything including your families that you came from that they're all bad and have to be shunned and that your true family is here and that this is the only place where you get unconditional acceptance and so that you know I mean it's like this non-stop and then more songs and back to dinner and more lecture and then singing and then it's lights out so that's the typical day now when you look at the graph for the different types of social influence the informational and normative social influence I think it it's pretty clear to follow in the sense that when when we're sitting around the table talking about how bad life is on the outside the new recruit <clears throat> may not believe that, but the, the new recruit may, may feel the social pressure. I mean, I didn't believe the stuff that they were saying, but I felt the social pressure to the point where I had to lie and just make stuff up. I mean, I, I, I never bought into their philosophy. I thought I, I couldn't really understand what it is that they were trying to do. But I, I found it interesting that they were so enthusiastic. It, it got really tiresome after uh, a couple of days. And I was there for two weeks. But to constantly hear people telling you how much they love you, I guess for some people that can be uh, a very affirming experience. For me, it was a very annoying experience. But I had a very strong sense of self. And uh, I was sneaking out at night to get high. <laughs> I was, even though they, they took, I didn't tell you this, they took my books away. When I wasn't in the bunkhouse, somebody went into my knapsack and took out my two books because they didn't want to have any outside information. The social influence strategies here, the informational influence and the normative influence, they're not going to work if you have access to alternative point of view. So there's no telephone, there's no newspaper, there's no television, and of course this is before a cell phone, so this, you know, it's fairly easy to control this, but every every new person there, their stuff got searched. And any material from the outside world gets taken out. I asked them about it. They said that they would give it back to me later. Which I think I did get the books back. I, I don't remember. For the period of time that I was there, it was very hard to keep my own internal sense of identity strong. I did do it, but it was very hard. One of the ways that I did it, and you know, if you look at me here, I mean, yeah, I, I, I wasn't the perfect teenager by any stretch. 
but uh, I had some attitude. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and I was sneaking off at night to get high at the Mooney camp. So one of the nights, and this is part of the story, one of the nights that I sneak out, you know, I smoke out in the woods, and then I'm coming back to the cabin to climb into bed, and I turn around and there's a big fire behind me. And at first, you know, I was I was stoned, so I thought, oh my God, I set the fo- the forest on fire. I must have dropped a match or something. Well, it wasn't it wasn't me. It turns out that there was a farm building in that direction. If I had kept going a little bit further, I would have stumbled on this farm building that they weren't using. And there was a local biker gang that was trying to scare the Moonies away. They lived up there. It was a, a local biker gang affiliated with the KKK. And they were shooting at the property and they were torching buildings. So it was some pretty serious stuff. They were making threats that they were going to kill people. I found a New York Times article, and this is just recently, detailing some of uh, the stuff that's going on. I think these two guys in the photo are guys that I interacted with there. And you can see the building that burned down that night. So I can put an exact date in August, uh, the events that transpired. So that was the night that I was going back to my bunk after getting high in the woods. And the bikers had been at that farm building and had burned it down. The, uh, the Moonies requested that the FBI investigate. About five or six years ago, I noticed that somebody had taken the FBI uh, report and put it online. It's still online. And it details several incidents like tires being slashed, direct threats being made. I think somebody walked into their communal property and started destroying things in broad daylight and then left. There were uh, shots that were fired from rifles at the buildings. And in the communal dining hall, right before I got there, the, the, the FBI report indicates that they pulled a, a bullet out of the woodwork of the dining hall where I was hanging out. Now, they never told me anything about this. Not only, I mean, not only did they not say that they were the Moonies or Unification Church, but they also never told us that they'd been having trouble with any of the locals. Now, I didn't have any money. I was 16 years old, and I, I, the reason why I was there is because I wanted to do something interesting, and I did not want to get a job for the summer. So I told them I didn't have any money. They were, um, I mean, they were requesting everyone who comes up there should give them some money. And in fact, they wanted a lot of money. They wanted everything you had if you were going to stay. Well, I, I talked my way into it. I said, look, I don't have any money because I'm only 18. Again, that's a lie. You know, just tell me what you want to do, uh, what you want me to do, and I'll work. So they put me to work on the security detail <laughs> never telling me that there's an active biker gang KKK outfit that's, you know, terrorizing them. And uh, they, they, they assigned me to go along the perimeter of their land to putting up no trespassing signs. I might have run into the bikers, you know, and gotten beaten up. Or <laughs> it was just a weird experience when I look back on it now. Yeah, so they weren't very forthcoming. Now, the whole idea from the Mooney perspective, from the organizational perspective, is that in order to make up for Eve's original sin of having had sex with Satan and therefore letting God down, the divine principle that they've put together in their philosophy is that in order to atone for all of that, you have to work uh, with all of your heart in order to make things right again. And in the Mooney uh, perspective, what that translates into is that you have to work all of your ability to make the organization work better. In other words, whatever you have is theirs. They, ex- they expect you to give everything that you have. And they'll, they'll, they'll get you a spouse. <laughs> One of the things that most people, if, if, you, if, if you know anything about the Moonies today, what most people understand is that they, they're the ones who do these mass marriages. Here's a photo of one of the mass marriages. They would marry like 4,000 couples at a time sometimes in gigantic stadiums. They, they did this many, many times. They basically, they picked people at random. And this too fed into the, the Mooney philosophy that if you have people who are fully realized within the Mooney uh, philosophy, that is to say they've graduated to the level where they're giving everything that they can to the organization and they're devotedly members of the Unification Church, then 
they can be married to another person who's reached that same level and thus create what they call the cosmic family. And if we have enough of these cosmic families across the globe making cosmic kids, we're, uh, you know, we're going to save the planet that way. That's, that was the Mooney perspective. Which, I mean, they, they described some of that while I was there, but it, it just uh, it never really made any sense to me, the whole cosmic marriage thing. I mean, how do you know that your kid is not going to rebel? Uh, how do you know that they're going to uh, maintain loyalty to the group? So what I see happening here in terms of the Ash and Sharif types of social influence is that when people first get there, they're being polite. They're saying, yes, I think that this group is great because hardcore members are doing so much to accommodate the newcomers. They're going out of their way. They're feeding you. They're saying how much they love you. They're really setting things up for you on a grand scale. I mean, I don't mean that the food was grand or anything like that, but they're doing a lot of work for you to get you comfortable and situated at their camp. They're going out of their way. So it would really be bad form for a newcomer to say, you know what, I think you guys suck, or anything other than something positive. And there were some people who were not buying it, and uh, they disappeared pretty quickly. They got rides. I mean, they were driven by the Moonies back to town, back to New York City. But I, I think that's the ash type of social influence, that you're willing to say things that you know are not true when there's so much uh, at stake. When, when you have, you form such a strong group identity and you don't want to let them down uh, because they're working so hard on your behalf, you feel that you're obliged to do the same for them. So you're going to say things and, uh, that, are, that you know are untrue and you're going to do things that you know are not in your best interest. And then the Sharif part, where reality is ambiguous, that starts creeping in, I think, around the first week or second week, depending on how malleable the person is and open to suggestion the person is. Now, I wasn't malleable at all. I maintained my my identity uh, throughout this entire experience, and I just, I, I thought it was fascinating to debate things with them. I think they got a little bit frustrated with me because I never seemed to be bending in their direction. I was just saying things on the surface that would placate them from one minute to the next. But I, I think I was probably hard for them to read because I did have long hair and I seemed like the perfect candidate for them. They like people who are runaways, you know, who are, who are uh, unconnected to uh, other important figures in life, which, which was not me. Uh, it, it, I mean, I looked like I might fit, but it, it, I had a strong sense of who I was and I just wanted to get my, my Kurt Vonnegut book back and start reading it again. But that, that Sharif style of informational influence starts to creep in around the uh, end of the first week or second week, maybe a little bit earlier, as reality starts to become ambiguous because you, you're now disconnected from the real world. You're at this camp, and this camp is one where you don't have any news from outside, you don't have any conversations with people outside, and all you keep getting is the same message of unconditional love uh, and the same really kind of flaky philosophy from the church elders with their own interpretation of the Bible and so on. After, after a while, I mean, things probably do start to get hazy, and that's when, that's when you get the, the drift, the informational influence drift, where you've forgotten where your baseline is, and you think that that dot of light really is moving even though it's not. And you're relying on the others to help you and define reality in that given situation. So that's my take on it in terms of how cults operate. The shackles are not physical shackles. In fact, when I wanted to leave, I just told them, you know, after two weeks I'd had enough, I said to them, hey, you know, I think what you have going on here is really great and that, um, you know, I, I need to go back to Manhattan, get more of my clothes and come back and um, then I'll be here full time. They bought it, they gave me a ride back to town, I jumped out in Times Square and they never saw me again. But the shackles are not physical. There's no climbing over fences to get away or anything like that. It's not Jim Jones and Jonestown where you're surrounded by jungle and there literally is no escape because they'll shoot you if you try. It's not like that. And maybe that's the differentiation between, you know, the severity levels of different types of doomsday cults. But the Moonies are not doomsday. The Moonies are very, they're a very optimistic group. They want to change the world for the better, and they think that they can do it. They're not as popular today, but uh, they're still around. 
I do think it qualifies as a cult primarily because all of your earnings have to go to the to the church. So you lose your sense of self. You lose your identity. Your identity becomes realigned as being a church member uh, who's basically working nonstop for the betterment of the church, not for yourself. Yeah, so that's that's the informational and normative influence uh, persuasion tactics used on a grand scale within the scope of an alternative living community, i.e. a cult. I uh, hope that was informative, and uh, stay tuned for the next one.